City. Oh, let's try that again. Can we try that again? Good morning, New City. Morning. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Hey, if you're able, stand with us and hear our call to worship this morning. The psalmist writes this, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When you look at your heaven, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the Son of Man, that you care for him. Our God is impossibly grand and still incredibly personal. He shows us his glory in the way he created the highest mountains, the deepest oceans, and the outermost part of space. And he still knows each of us down to the smallest detail. He cares for our need, not as possessions, but as his children. So sing with us, and let's praise our God together. Whose glory t- 
We were separated from God, and we stopped being able to see him clearly and rightly. Instead of seeing his glory and his goodness, we often think that he is distant and unloving, maybe distracted from us. We think, my issues are too small for him. I should really just handle this on my own. Or maybe God isn't answering my prayer because he's upset with me. Our hearts are broken by sin and need to be reminded of who God is and what he has done for us. So we're going to read this together in Psalm 86. Read the underlined portion with me. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. Pray with me this morning and let's confess together our need for God. He is faithful to listen. I'll start and you continue to pray as the Spirit leads. Father, you have not given us a spirit of fear and of shame, but of confidence. Confidence that comes from hope in you. We sometimes struggle to believe who you really are. Teach our hearts that you are better, that you are good, that you are satisfying. When we chase after lies, you pursue us because you love us. We don't have to prove ourselves because in your grace, you have accepted the work of Jesus on our behalf. Remind us of the gospel.
with him to endless life. He will hold me fast till our faith is done to sight. He will hold me fast till our faith is done to sight. When he comes at last, he will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He Read these verses with me. Read the underlined part. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Even though our trust in God ebbs and flows, he is unchanging. In Jesus, we see God is close. He's merciful, generous, and he's motivated by love. He gave his own perfect life as a substitute for our imperfect ones. So instead of being frustrated or distant from us, he draws close to us with compassion, even when we were dead in our sins and had nothing to offer him. Continue singing with us. Let's celebrate this good news. Changing grace in every high. 
Jesus, thank you. You set aside your throne in heaven, your seat beside your Father and your glory to come to our rescue. You took on humanity, experiencing pain, suffering, and injustice, just like us. And you endured the full penalty of sin that was meant for us. Thank you for loving us. Holy Spirit, open our eyes. Help us to see God and ourselves clearly. Help our hearts to be changed by the gospel. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let us welcome one another, just as Christ has so lovingly welcomed us into his family. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hey, it's good to see everybody this morning. Welcome to New City. Uh, we're really glad to have you with us today. And uh, if you are visiting with us this morning, we're especially glad to have you. Uh, and I, I mean that. You could be anywhere, and here you are with us today. So we're thankful for you. And uh, if you haven't stopped by, and met our Connect team member um, members who are uh, at the Connect bar. After the service, we'd love to have you stop by and meet one of them. Uh, we would love to send uh, you home with a New City gift. Um, even if you're not going to come back, even if you're just passing through, uh, stop by, give us a little bit of information. I promise we won't harass you with follow-up, but we would love to send you home with the world's greatest coffee mug or the world's greatest uh, bag one of those. Um, they Either one has our New City logo on it, and um, even if you're not coming back, we want you to take one home so that when you see that logo, you remember us and you can pray for us, and we will be praying for you as well. I promise we won't 
harass you and follow up. We'll just send you an email so that you have somebody to get in touch with if there's anything that we can do for you or anything that you need. So stop by after the service and meet one of our Connect Team members. I hope you guys got one of these when you came in, our bulletin order of service. There are a lot of announcements in there. If you are a New City regular, you can find all of these on our Church Center app as well. Um, but not going to go through all these. Um, our youth, a couple of announcements there. Uh, they are meeting on Sundays now, not Tuesdays, so make sure that you're aware of that if you have um, a, a child in the youth group. Um, summer camp deadlines coming up for youth and our kids. If you signed up for or planned on going to our new city class, you are very late um, because it is happening right now, and it's okay if you're late. You're welcome to, um, to go now if you want to do that. Partners, our partners dinner is coming up um, like we're almost there. So make sure that you're signed up for that uh, and ready to come and be a part of it. Um, Fifth Sunday giving, that's one I did want to spend a second on. For those of you who are new to New City, a few years ago we started this. Every month that has five Sundays, all of our in-house giving on the fifth Sunday goes to support one of our ministry partners. And... Um, uh, this month, we have five Sundays, and uh, all of our in-house giving is going to support Young Life Macon. Uh, we love Young Life Macon, the leaders. Um, they are sharing the gospel uh, with high school students, and we love that we can be a part of that uh, in different ways. This is one of the ways. So I am encouraging you to make sure that you're here on the fifth Sunday and that you give generously so that we can support the good work that they are doing. Some dollar books on our bookshelves. Those are good books. They're not trash books um, worth well more than a dollar. Uh, and volunteer needs. We always have volunteer needs. Let me just say this about volunteering. Uh, even if you're not a partner at New City, if you're a regular um, and you are a believer, as believers, we are servants, and we should serve. And so, um, so serve. If you're not serving, find a place, plug in, uh, and serve. Serve with us. Serve alongside us. Okay, enough of that. We got a lot to cover this morning. Um, a huge section of scripture that we're covering. Uh, if you have your Bible or your Bible on your phone and you want to turn to uh, Acts chapter 10 to join us, we're going to go through Acts chapter 10 verse 1 all the way through chapter 11 verse 18. And the reason that we're covering all of these verses at one time, it's very difficult. There's a lot that we could talk about, um, but rather than bogging down in a lot of the details, I want to make sure that we see this whole story this morning and how... Um, how incredible this story is. Telling it all at once is the only way that it makes sense, or at least makes the most sense. So I want to pray this morning. Uh, every week I ask you guys if you would pray with me, and I'm asking you to do that today. Uh, let's pray that God would be especially good to us to, to teach us, to encourage us, that the Holy Spirit would bring conviction in our lives where we need that, and um, pray that New City would be the church that, that God wants His church to be. Would you all pray those things with me? Yeah, good. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you that we can come together and pray, um, and that this faith of ours is uh, not a spectator sport, um, but even now as we pray, we are participants um, pleading pleading with you to be especially gracious to us today, uh, to teach us, Holy Spirit. Uh, I pray that, um, that, that, that Spirit, you would, you would be good to uh, bring this story to life for us, uh, to help us see what an incredible day that this was um, in, in history. And I pray that you would help us to see that this isn't just a story uh, from the Bible or from the book of Acts, uh, but this is our story as well. Sink that deep in our hearts. Uh, shape us to be the people, individuals, and families that you want us to be. Uh, make us the church that you want us to be. Uh, for your glory, Father, and for the good of your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so to help us see um, the enormity of this day. It's an enormous day in the book of Acts and, and why like there are some really big things that happen in this story today. And to see why this 
huge of a day was necessary. I want us to step back again. We, we do this a lot. We did it last week. We're doing it again. I'll keep it short. But um, to set some historic context for us so that we can see why this day needed to be such a big day in the history of the church. Um, so what I want us to see as we step back is the problem of the Great Divide. The problem of the Great Divide. We talked last week about um, God's big story uh, and how Acts is a part of this bigger story of God. Uh, We talk a lot about it here, creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. And and I want to make sure that we see what was happening here in that bigger theme of all history, right? So creation, God created in the book of Genesis. Um, He created, he created the world, the heavens, the stars, everything. He created people. And when he created Adam and Eve, he created them to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth with image bearers. They were to be his people, and he would be their God. We know in the book of Genesis that it didn't take very long uh, for this plan to, to, to fall apart. Fall, the fall is what we call it. Sin entered the world, and it wrecked God's creation and separated his people from one another, and it separated his people from him. But Genesis 3.15, as early as Genesis 3.15, we see a promise from God that he would right the wrongs. God was not satisfied that people would be separated from one another, nor that they would be separated from him. And so we have this promise that, that God would remedy these wrongs, that he would make them right, and, and he would redeem his people from sin and crush the head of the serpent. God would redeem his people through a redeemer, and we know that that redeemer um, is Jesus, right? The redeemer would come, and, and, and he would right all of the wrongs, and he would finish what God started in creation. God would have a people. The earth would be filled with his image bearers, Jesus, that redeemer. And we talked last week about um, how Jesus hasn't finished yet, right? That wasn't God's plan. We've got his life, his death, his resurrection, and ascension. And when Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father, he ascended with the promise that he was going to return. And when he returns, he will defeat his enemies, he will gather his people, and he will usher in this beautiful kingdom that God has, has promised. This is the restoration, right? Creation, fall, redemption. Our Redeemer has come. He will come again, and when he comes, he will restore all things as God intended in the beginning. Now, here's something that we need to remember about that in terms of our story in, in Acts. Jesus, the Redeemer, was born a Jew. He was born a Jew, Jewish people, Hebrew people. The, the world that he was born in, his culture and context was that. It was a Hebrew world. And this is really, really important. In God's story, um, in the Old Testament and even in, in the Gospels, we see that God had chosen a particular people to represent him. God had chosen a nation, and that nation was Israel, the Hebrew people. God made his covenant, not with the world, not with everybody. God made his covenant with Israel, with these special people. God gave them the law. God gave them a land. God gave them the temple. And in the temple, he would dwell with his people. uh, And they would worship in his presence. God had a special relationship with these chosen people, the Hebrew people, the Jewish people. But, but... God's kingdom was always meant to be more than the Hebrew people. God's kingdom was always meant to be for all of the peoples of the earth. And we see that in Exodus 19. The book of Exodus, um, God is making his covenant with his people. He's, he's brought them out of slavery. He's making his covenant. He's giving them promises. He's telling the Hebrew people not just who he is. He's telling them who they are and how they should live, particularly as his people. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 5, God says this, Now, therefore... If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my commandment, you shall be my treasured possession. Where? Among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. 
Now, God talking to the nation, the Hebrew people, they were to be a kingdom of priests. Not only were they to be a kingdom of priests to one another, but God's plan for them was to be a kingdom of priests where? Among all the peoples of the earth. They were to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth as God had started in the garden. The way that they were to do that is by bringing the nations around them to God. That was God's plan. That was their mission. Hey, you will be my special people. You will point all of the world to me and you will bring them to me. God making for himself one people from all of the nations. They didn't do a very good job. Israel did not do a very good job in their mission. And for the most part, what we, what we see is the divide between God's chosen people, the Hebrews, um, and, and the nations. The, the, the divide had become so great in the minds of the Hebrew people that they came to believe that they were superior to all the other peoples of the earth. Because of their birth line, they thought they were better than all of the peoples of the earth. That God didn't love the Gentiles. Gentiles was everybody who was not Hebrew. So the only people in their mind that God really loved were the Hebrew people. God didn't love the nations. They had come to believe that the, the, the nations really had no place in God's kingdom and, and no place with them as God's people after all They were unclean people. A provision was made. We read about that in the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament as well. Provision was made for those Gentiles who became believers. Um, When they became believers in the Hebrew God, they, they would be circumcised. They had to adopt all of the culture that was the Hebrew culture. They had to begin to follow the law. They had to keep all of the feasts and all of the festivals. And they were called proselytes. Now, this is likely in the book of Acts in chapter 8. We read about the Ethiopian eunuch, and this was probably what he was, a man who was not born Hebrew, but who had come to believe in the Hebrew God and and keep the Jewish laws. He was a proselyte. But even here, there was still a great divide, right? So there was provision that was made for the Gentiles, these filthy, unclean people. If they believed in God, then there was some provision that was made for them, but there still existed a great divide. Jews were not to marry even the proselytes. Proselytes could not come to the temple. They they could come to the temple. They just couldn't come into the temple. They were required to worship outside of the temple. They couldn't enter into the temple and into the presence of of God. They couldn't serve in the temple. They couldn't be priests to God's people. They were at best, though these provisions had been made, they were at best distant relatives to the people that God had chosen, the Hebrew people. They were distant relatives who just didn't quite belong. So these Gentiles, non-Hebrew born people, they were, they were generally loathed by the Jews. Even the proselytes were not welcomed. It was more that they were tolerated, and even there, barely. This was the world that Jesus was born into, right? He, he was a Hebrew. He was a Jew. He was born into this world. It, this was the world in which his life, death, and resurrection took place. This was the world that, that Peter and the other apostles lived in. This is the world that they lived in. They were a people who lived very divided from the Gentiles, who looked down on the Gentiles, who often loathed, who hated the Gentiles. This is also the world in which Jesus commanded his disciples in Matthew chapter 28, as you go, he said, make disciples, make disciples of all nations, of all peoples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. It's also in this divided world, right, where, where the apostles, the Jews, despised the Gentiles and didn't want to be around them. It's in this divided world as Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father that he reminded them of that commission. And he said, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. 
See, God wanted all along, God's plan all along was to fill the world with image bearers. And these image bearers would be a kingdom of, of, of his people, a kingdom from all the peoples of the earth. The people that God had given this message of the gospel to, the Jewish people, they were were very divided from the rest of the world. The, the, The apostles did not love the Gentiles. They often despised the Gentiles. There was this incredible divide. This divide, like I, I, I... Anytime I'm teaching this, it's a, it's a struggle to teach it because I don't think we see a divide as large as this divide was. But, but historically, if you think back to civil rights and slavery, it, this divide was probably bigger than the divide that has existed in our country between black and white. The hatred, the distrust, the abuse... That's the divide only greater that, that, that they lived in. This was the divide between Jew and Gentile. And, and y'all, that is a big problem. A huge problem. How, how would God overcome this great divide? How would God overcome the beliefs and the fears that the apostles had come to hold on to? How would God bridge this great divide? Cornelius. Cornelius. Peter, Peter in the first church, right, Pri- primarily Jewish, with, with, with the addition of maybe some proselytes along the way, they needed something really, really big from God in, in order for God to effectively communicate that he wanted Gentiles in the church and they played a major part of the kingdom of God. They needed something that was, that was clear and unmistakable. This divide between Jew and Gentile had existed for them, with them, for more than 1,000 years. A thousand years. Think about that in terms of of the age of our country. More than a thousand years, this divide was there. They needed something big. They needed an undeniable witness. And that's where our story in Acts chapter 10 comes in. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read all of the verses. You are welcome to follow along in your Bible if you have that, but I'm just going to tell the story and, and hit a lot of the highlights. So uh, a lot of this happens in uh, a city called Caesarea. Symbolically, this was really, really important. It's located in the Roman-ruled region of Judea, and it serves as the capital of that area, of that region. Everything about this city screamed Rome. The city itself was a Roman highlight. It had a Roman-built amphitheater. They had an incredible um, aqueduct system, uh, a a world-renowned harbor. There were other incredible buildings and libraries that were built by Herod. Caesarea was like Rome in Judea. Now, to guard this great city and all the Roman citizens who populated that city and the port, there were a lot of Roman soldiers who were stationed there, and one of those soldiers was named Cornelius, and Cornelius is described as a centurion. A centurion was an officer in the Roman army, non-commissioned. He had worked his way up through the ranks. Now, that means that he had been a Roman soldier for a good long while, and he had done a really good job at being a Roman soldier. He had risen through the ranks to command a group of a um, 100 soldiers. Here's how Luke describes Cornelius going through our verses. Cornelius, Gentile. Uh, Roman soldier says that he and his family are, are, were devout, God-fearing people. Chapter 10, verse 2. Verse 22, upright and God-fearing. Chapter 10, verse 28, a Gentile, but respected by the Jewish people in verse 22. He prayed. He prayed at the designated times that the uh, Jewish people were supposed to pray. Chapter 10, verse 30. He was someone who gave gifts frequently to the poor. Chapter 10, verse 4. But he was not a proselyte. 
He was not a proselyte. Chapter 11, verse 3 says he had never been circumcised. So, so here is Cornelius. He's someone who had come to believe in the God of the Hebrew people, and, and he was doing his best to pursue that God. Cornelius is praying, and an angel of the Lord comes to him in a vision and tells him, Cornelius, God has heard your prayers, and God has seen your alms. Send some of your men to Joppa. Have them go to Simon the Tanner's house where Peter is staying. Have them bring Peter to you because Peter's got something to tell you. Now that's crazy, right? Here's this Gentile, and he's praying, he's pursuing God, and God comes to him in this vision and says, hey, I I hear your prayers, I see your your almsgiving, I I, I see you, Cornelius. Send some of your men to get Peter and bring them back. Peter's got something to tell you. He didn't even know who Peter was. So Cornelius gathers a couple of soldiers, and he he sends them for Peter. Peter, uh, we talked about Peter last week. The day after Cornelius sends his men off toward Joppa, Peter, who is staying at Simon the Tanner's house, goes up and and prays. Uh, Peter was, for those of you new to the Acts story, Peter was a Jew. Um, He was coming from Jerusalem. He was one of Jesus' original disciples. He was a leader in the new church. He was a a, a, a huge part of the movement of Christianity. Now, this is important, knowing his Hebrew background, his Jewishness, because men like Cornelius were not well-liked by men who were like Peter. It was bad enough that Cornelius was a Gentile, right? A filthy Gentile, an unclean, filthy Gentile. But even worse than that, he was a Roman soldier. If we want to make it even worse than just being a Roman soldier who oppressed God's people, this was a guy who had been a Roman soldier for a while. And he had made it his life to be a Roman soldier. He was such a good Roman soldier and oppressed the people so well that he had risen in the ranks of the Roman army. Peter would see, not just Peter, but Peter and and his Jewish brothers would see a man like Cornelius and often believe not just that they were unclean, filthy Gentiles, but worse, they were completely unsavable. Nothing that God could do with them. So here's Peter, right, in Joppa. He's at Simon the Tanner's house. He goes upstairs to pray, and while he's praying, we see that he is hungry, and he falls into a trance. Um, And he has this incredible supernatural vision. The heavens open up. When you see the heavens open up in the scripture, God is getting ready to do something. And that was the case here. The heavens open up. God is getting ready to do something. And something like a sheet begins to be let down from heaven. Now, let me pause here. God is speaking to Peter. And Peter is doing what? Praying. God speaks to Cornelius, and Cornelius was doing what? Praying. Now, I'm not going to say that God won't do it, but but God is probably going to speak to us more when we pray than when we watch Netflix. Right? It's not a sermon on prayer. I just wanted to throw that out there for you. So Peter has this vision. He's praying, and something like a sheet begins to be let down from heaven. And and in the sheet, Peter sees all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds. It's filled with animals that, under the Jewish law, were not supposed to be eaten. Unclean food. It was all filthy, unclean food. Now, oddly, as as Peter is seeing this come down from heaven in this trance and, and this vision, a voice comes from heaven and tells Peter, kill the animals and eat. And Peter is like, no, not me. Like, I have never eaten anything that is unclean or common. That's what Peter says. Peter, Peter, kill and eat. Nope, not me. Like, this is nuts. I have never eaten anything unclean or common. Three times God speaks again. Peter, Peter, he says, what I have made clean, don't call common. Three times. Peter, kill and eat. No, 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 I don't eat anything that's unclean or common. Peter, stop calling what I have cleaned unclean. Stop calling what I have set apart common. Peter is perplexed, right? He's like, I don't know what to do with this. 
Peter is perplexed. He, he's confused. He's trying to make sense out of the vision that he sees. And the Holy Spirit comes to him while he's doing this. And the Holy Spirit speaks to Peter and says, Hey, Peter, look, three men are here and they are looking for you. Get up now and go with them. I've sent them. This is a crazy story, isn't it? While God is telling Peter that, while Peter is having the vision and the Holy Spirit comes as Peter's trying to figure it out, and he says, Peter, get up. I've sent three guys. They're here for you. Get up and go with them. While that's happening, the three guys are at the door, and they're knocking on the door, and they're coming in downstairs. Peter is upstairs. Peter comes downstairs, sees them, and he's like, hey, I'm the guy you're looking for. And the guys who have come for him say, man, this is great because Cornelius sent us to get you because you have something to tell him. So let's go back to Caesarea. So the next day, that's exactly what they did. The next day, they get up and they head for Caesarea and things just get crazier. Like this is an amazing story. When they get to Caesarea, to, to Cornelius' house, Cornelius is waiting and he's gathered his whole family. Now here's the thing. Cornelius didn't stop with just his family. The the faith here, like Cornelius knew something incredible was going to happen. Cornelius is waiting, but he's gathered all of his family. He's gathered his friends. He's probably got co-workers there. Anybody who would come, Cornelius has opened up his house, and his house is packed full of people. Peter gets there, and they walk in, and Cornelius falls down, and he begins to worship Peter, and Peter says, man, get up. This isn't about me. Let me tell you about this incredible vision that I had. And he begins to tell Cornelius uh, about the vision. He says, Cornelius, you know that I shouldn't be here. I am a Jew, and I shouldn't be associating with you as a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not consider any person as common or unclean. And that's why I'm here. I should not consider any person as common or unclean. And then Peter begins to proclaim the gospel. Peter's message. Look at verse 34. So Peter opened his mouth. I love this. This is the gospel, right? Peter just begins to tell the story of Jesus and proclaim the gospel. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. Like he's learning. Peter's learning. God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. And they put him to death. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God, God raised him on the third day and made him to appear. Not to all people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him... To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Peter is telling this Gentile, pointing back to the Old Testament scripture and saying, this is him and we are witnesses. This is the Redeemer and we saw his work. This is him who the prophets spoke of and said that whoever believes in him will receive forgiveness through his name. And this part is so good. Verse 44, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. Peter wasn't even finished preaching. Peter's like, wait a minute, I've still got more to say. Peter hasn't finished his sermon, and just as he's getting started, this is like the shortest sermon that we read. Peter is preaching, the Holy Spirit drops in, and when he does, it just gets crazy. The Gentiles, the Gentiles start speaking in tongues, and they're praising God. 
Peter and his brothers, they're, they're, the, the people who came with him from, from Jerusalem, the Jews, they, they, they're absolutely amazed, verse 45 says. Wait a minute, wait a minute. They're looking at each other and saying, I thought this Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit and, and speaking in tongues like this, I thought that was only for us Jews. And Peter says, I guess we were wrong. Maybe we should baptize them. And they did. And they did. This was like a, a mini Pentecost, right? You remember in the beginning of the book of Acts, Pentecost? Jesus had said, you know, you guys pray and wait. And when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to come with power. And then you'll be my witnesses. And, and on the day of Pentecost, he came. And they saw these tongues of fire, and there was a mighty rushing wind. And suddenly everyone who had gathered in that upper room and was praying began to speak in tongues. And thousands of people heard all of the commotion. And on that day, 3,000 were added, and the church had its start. This is many Pentecost. And this, this, this filthy Gentile's house is filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and, and suddenly, the people who are there, Peter hasn't even finished his message, and the Holy Spirit drops in on them, and they begin to speak in tongues, and they begin praising God. It is, it is incredible. The gospel had come full on to the Gentiles, and the Spirit of, of, of God had shown up just like he had with the Jews. These Gentiles believed the good news of who Jesus was and what he had done. They believed the gospel, and, and the Spirit came and filled them. The Spirit came with the same power that he had come when he came to the Jews. And it's obvious. It's obvious to Peter and the other Jews who were there because of the singing and the praising and the speaking in tongues. It is undeniable. All of this reinforcing Peter's dream. Peter, these unclean Roman soldiers and their families are saved by the same gospel that you were. Peter, I am not withholding salvation for the Gentiles. I am, I am not withholding my blessings from them nor my power. They have the same spirit as you do, Peter. With God, there is no partiality. And boom. Right? Just like that, just like that, salvation has come to the Gentiles, and it is absolutely undeniable. Incredible day. There's one more party in the story um, that we have to talk about, and that's the church, right? The church. Word spread really quickly about what had happened. Peter had stuck around with Cornelius and the other people there and was likely teaching them. Um, and when he returned to Jerusalem, this brewing controversy erupts. Chapter 11, verse 3 tells us a little bit about it. The Jewish believers have heard how Peter was hanging out with those filthy Gentiles and sharing the gospel with them. Um, hanging out, eating meals with unclean, uncircumcised Gentiles, and they begin to criticize Peter. Now, before we cast stones at them, we need to understand and remember the context. Like, this is, this is what they had grown up with. They, they had wrongly been taught that this is the way life was supposed to be. They had learned it from their parents, who learned it from their parents, who learned it from their parents, and have already said for a thousand years, this is what was being taught. That they had been taught that the Gentiles should be avoided, and ultimately that they were, they were unsavable. So their questions and, and concerns are, are, are legitimate. This is, this is the same issue that Jesus faced when, when he was with us and, and, and walked, walked among us. The Pharisees often criticizing Jesus because he hung out with unclean people. Because he, he ate with sinners. What kind of man are you? You call yourself a teacher? And Jesus said, look, I, 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 I didn't come for the righteous. I came for the unrighteous. It's not the healthy who needs a doctor. It's the sick. So the church is now wrestling with this very same thing. What do we do with these people who are not Jewish? Should they, should they have to become Jewish in order to become Christian? 
Do they, do they have to be circumcised? Do they have to observe the feast and the holidays? Do they have to keep all of the law? Do, do, they, do they have to look like us in order to be a Christian? Do they have to act like us in order to be a Christian? Should they, should they talk like us? Should they speak the same language as us? Now hear me. We often wrestle with those same questions, don't we? Clean yourself up and get your life together and Jesus might take care of you. So Peter, as they have all of those questions, what do we do with these people? Peter just tells them what happened. Peter tells them the story of, of what happened, how, how God came to him in this vision, the things that God said to him, how Cornelius was having uh, uh, dreams and a vision as he was praying as well, and how Cornelius had sent his men to find Peter, and Peter went with them and, and, and telling them what happened when he shared the gospel with them and how they became believers, and that, that while he was preaching this sermon, the Holy Spirit dropped in, and the room was filled with the Holy Spirit and the power of God, and, and these people people were filled with the same Holy Spirit that those people in Jerusalem witnessed. He tells them the story of how they believed and received the Holy Spirit. The religious leaders, verse 18 says, when the religious leaders heard that testimony, they fell silent. And then they glorified God. They fell silent and then they glorified God saying, then to the Gentiles... Also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. That is incredible. But we're here because of that. We are those filthy Gentiles, unless you happen to be born a Hebrew. Like, this is our story. This is how the gospel came to us. Like, like, like just, just like that, the, the gospel has come to the Gentiles in this mighty and miraculous way. And, and just like that, through all of these events, the door has now been opened wide for the gospel to go to the ends of the earth, from, from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth and to all the peoples of the earth. Now listen, the bridge between Jew and Gentile was not Pentecost II. The bridge wasn't these miraculous events. The, the bridge that united Jew and Gentile was the same bridge then that spans the great divide now between black and white, between black and white and Asian and Hispanic. The same bridge that unites rich and poor and educated and uneducated. And that bridge isn't tongues. It isn't dreams. It isn't miracles. It's not Cornelius. It's Jesus. And, and this good news of what Jesus has done is not for one group of people and not another group of people. This good news that our sins are forgiven through, through Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, is for all people and all peoples. The good news that, that in him we are redeemed and made children of God is for everyone. This good news is for Jew and Gentile and black and white and rich and poor and educated and uneducated. And here is the real beauty of it all. One group doesn't come in as a proselyte to be kept at arm's distance because the beauty of the gospel and what God has done in Jesus is that he has made us all family. We are not just reconciled to God in Christ. We are, and that is beautiful. We are reconciled to one another. As, as the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians 2, verse 14, Jesus has broken down the, the dividing wall of hostility that existed between Jew and Gentile, between black and white and brown and every other color, between rich and poor, educated and uneducated. The dividing wall of separation, the dividing wall of hostility has been broken down in Jesus. And God has made for himself one people of all the peoples of the earth. 
Peter and the, and the first church needed a big, miraculous, Holy Spirit, God day to help them see and believe the amazing power of the gospel. So do we. That's why it's in here. So that we don't forget this story. So that we don't forget the reality of that dividing wall being broken down. So that we know what the kingdom of God looks like. And it doesn't have a black section and a white section. The gospel really does change everything. So let's step back from our story and talk about some of the implications from this incredible story implications for us and there are a lot that we could talk about i'm only going to hit on a few and i'll hit them pretty quickly but i want to give you a few one is this the king will rescue his people like we should have confidence in our god knowing that our king will rescue his people i get asked sometimes because the bible is clear there is only one way to be right with the father and that is through the son people hear that and they say well what about the people who have never heard the gospel Well, this doesn't answer all of the questions about the people who don't hear the gospel, but it does answer some, and I love the way that it does. It is such a beautiful, beautiful story. Cornelius was was a man who had come to believe in the God, the God, the God of the Jews, but, but, but he didn't know him fully. He didn't have the promises of God. He didn't have all of the things of God that had been made available to the Jews, but as best he could, he was trying to follow the God that he believed in. And he did not have the gospel for sure. And the gospel at this point, after the life, death, and resurrection, man, the, 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 the focus of faith, according to Romans 10, is that. It's not just that we believe in God. It's that we, we know and believe and trust in the work of Jesus. Cornelius didn't have that. But, but he believed in God. So, so, so what did God do? Do, do? do we get a picture of God wringing his hands and saying, man, I sure hope somebody figures out something for this Cornelius guy. He's such a great guy. Did, did he look at Cornelius and say, man, Cornelius, you've been doing a pretty good job of things. I'm sorry you don't know, know more. Good luck. No, here is the beautiful thing that we see is God moving worlds to save his people. God God orchestrated all of these events, and and the timing of it is so incredible. God moved Cornelius' world. God moved his world to send those men to Joppa and find a man named Peter who had something to tell him, Peter who he didn't know. God, God moved the world of Peter, first of all, that he was at Simon the Tanner's house to begin with. He should never have been there. And that's where God put him. And then God comes to him in this dream that just rocks his world and he doesn't know what's happening. Holy Spirit shows up and says, listen, I've sent some guys for you and they're downstairs. Get yourself up and go with them. How incredible. God is is, is moving the worlds of people so that Cornelius and his household can hear the gospel. How incredible. Crazy and incredible is all of that. God did all of that to save Cornelius and open the door to the Gentiles for the gospel. And our king still does that today to rescue his people. Our king will rescue his people. Here's the second thing that I think we should see. The king's kingdom is colorful. Right? We, we talked here about the great divide that existed between Jew and Gentile and how God bridged that great chasm that, that, that had separated them. The, the truth is that God's kingdom is filled with all kinds and all colors of people. All colors of people, all shades of people, they will all be a part of the kingdom of God. Tall people will be a part of the kingdom, short people, rich people, poor people, people with special needs will be a part of the kingdom. People that we look at and we look at their life and we say they have no need at all, they're going to be a part of the kingdom as well. People that you like and you enjoy being around, they're going to be a part of the kingdom. But listen to me, there's going to be some people who are a part of the kingdom that you don't even like. 
They're going to be a part of the kingdom as well. People who speak English, people who speak other languages, languages that we've never heard of, they're going to be a part of the kingdom of God. People who have been great to us and people who have been mean to us. You know, there are going to be murderers in the kingdom of God. Paul is one of them. People that we fear, people that we distrust, man, God is going to do a miraculous work and they're going to be a part of the kingdom of God. People who ride motorcycles and people who drive race cars and people who walk tight ropes and people who, who deep sea dive, like they're all going to be a part of the kingdom of God. Americans, Mexicans, Cubans, Chinese, Japanese, French, and on and on and on we can go. We'll all be a part of the kingdom of God and we'll all be a part of the kingdom of God together there with Him. And together. Together in this colorful kingdom, we, we, we will be singing and praising and laughing and dancing. One people, his people. How fitting. Like, I don't know if you, ever got, you guys ever think of this or not. How, t- tomorrow, it, it, our country celebrates Martin Luther King, Jr. We started this sermon series. I can promise you I never once thought about Martin Luther King falls on this day. And yet here we are talking about his dream. But it wasn't his dream. The dream that he had was the dream of God. That there would be one kingdom and, 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 and one people. Together, one. All shades and all colors. One people. His people. And God... God, make New City that church. Y'all pray that with me. That God would make New City that church a, a colorful glimpse of his kingdom. Another big one. For the king's kingdom, there are no unsavables. There are no unsavables. Ananias thought that Saul, the persecutor of the church, the apostle Paul, Ananias thought that, 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 that this murderer, this persecutor of the church was unsavable. Right? When, when God came to Ananias and said, hey, I want you to go and talk to Saul, Ananias was like, listen, I know Saul. I'm not sure I'm hearing you right. Ananias was wrong. Peter, Peter thought that a, a, a Gentile Roman soldier, the oppressor of God's people, stood absolutely no chance of being saved. And God showed him in a really, really huge way that Peter was wrong. Most of us have, have someone, an individual or maybe a group of people that we think is beyond God's work. We, we, we think that they are unsavable, that there is just no way that God can do anything with them. Listen to me. You are wrong. You are wrong. Some of those unsavables will sing with us and maybe even dance with you. No one is beyond the amazing grace of our King. And that leads me to this. The king sends us. God came to Peter and, and, and showed Peter what he was doing through this vision. He said, Peter, get up and go. The Holy Spirit said, I've sent these three men. You get up and go downstairs and go with them. I've got a job for you to do. He sent Peter. He sent Peter to share the gospel in another city with a complete stranger. We saw again in chapter 9, God speaking to Ananias and saying, Ananias, go to Judas's house on Straight Street, and there you're going to find Saul. I need you to talk to him about the gospel. God sent Ananias. God sends his people. God sends his people to special places. God sends his people. Sometimes, sometimes God sends his people to special places, places overseas, places in other parts of the country. God sends his people to particular people to share the gospel. Sometimes, but listen to me, I grew up thinking that that was the only people who were sent. Here is the truth. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are sent. We are all sent, and when I say we, I don't mean everybody but you. 
I mean, you are sent. The Great Commission, as you go, as you go, the assumption is you're going. As you go, you were sent. You were going as God sent people to share the glorious news of Jesus, to proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness and into His marvelous light. As you go, as you go to work, as you go to school, as you go to the park, as you go to the gym, as you go about your life, you go as one sent by the King to extend the bounds of His kingdom, to be fruitful and multiply. And fill the earth with his image bearers. You are sent. Telling the people around you that Jesus saves. And through that, Jesus is saving. Jesus is saving the unsavables. Jesus is saving the colorfuls. Making for himself one people. Just like he intended in the garden. What an incredible story. Amen? Listen to me. This is not just a Bible story. This is our story. This is the story that we are living in. I say again, we are the, we are the filthy Gentiles that the gospel has come to. By grace, being saved and welcomed into the family of God. We, we are the ones now sent who are waiting on our king to come back and fully and finally establish his kingdom. Until, until he returns, we are the sent ones. Making disciples as we go. Baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey everything that he has commanded. This is our story new city let's live like it's our story let's pray father thank you for this incredible story thank you that you save the unsavables like me Holy Spirit, I pray that you would help us believe this story. Not that we would just know it. Oh yeah, I remember that story. Help us to believe this story. The truth of this story. The historic place of this story. Help us us to believe that this is our story. Because it is. Shape, shape our lives, Holy Spirit, by this story. Help us to be a church of these people. Help us to be a part of seeing the gospel saturate all of middle Georgia and beyond. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. We close out this morning as we do every week uh, at New City with communion. We're going to have a couple of songs, and I would encourage you during these songs, uh, take a minute if the Holy Spirit has convicted you of anything in your life where you're not walking with Jesus, repent. That means turn from that and turn to Him. Turn to Him and receive the grace and forgiveness that's yours and walk with Him again. That's the beautiful thing about grace. We start over. The table is a reminder of God's grace. It's a reminder of the great sacrifice that was made to bring us that redemption and ultimately restoration. There's a table behind me, one at the back, uh, downstairs and uh, upstairs in the balcony as well. Uh, Take a minute, repent, and then come to the table and celebrate the grace that's yours in Jesus. We have individual communion packets. We have bread and juice. The bread represents his body given for us. The juice represents his blood shed for us. In that, we have redemption of sin. We are made children of God. We're made family. One big, colorful, diverse family. Celebrate that this morning through communion. When you're ready, come. Take the bread, dip it in the juice, and celebrate Jesus. We're going to have members of our prayer team that will come forward. They're going to be wearing a green lanyard. Um, They would love to pray with you or for you. If you have 
any questions about what it means to love and follow Jesus, to be a Christian, to be a disciple, they would love to talk with you about that as well. Um, when you're ready, come. Would you stand?
sweet the sound of saving grace. How sweet the sound of saving grace. Christ died for me. Amen. God has done an amazing work in us, but it isn't over yet. We still live in a broken world that is hurting and sinful, but there is hope. God has promised that there will be a new kingdom, free from pain and sadness and injustice and brokenness, and he is building that family and that kingdom, and we're invited into that story with him. So let's sing this last song together and encourage one another in what we know is still to come.
We get to play a part in God's story every day as our friends, our coworkers, and our family see us living out this kingdom we just sang about. Even in our tough seasons, our broken situations, and our failures, God is faithfully working to make all things new. So go sharing the hope of the gospel. New City Church, you are sent.